Hey, good morning, church, and happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Man, we love you. We appreciate you. Uh, I am now a father of two lovely children, Liam and Lucia. What's up to both of you guys? Um, And so, dads, so thankful to Jesus for you. I'm also a dad, so in the midst of COVID, you know, Hunger Games style, however you do that, I feel you. It's been quite a season, um, but listen, it's just a blessing. I hope you feel loved and celebrated. Hopefully, you got a great breakfast, or you got an awesome lunch, or you went fishing, or or golf, or or you do whatever you do, but I'm praying you sense deep encouragement and appreciation. Um, And and hey, listen, I also get that for for a lot of us this morning, Father's Day is a painful day. I know that for me, this is my first uh, Father's Day preaching since my dad passed away unexpectedly last year. Um, I'm I'm sure I will cry at some point, and that's okay, because we're processing through that. And so if you're in a spot like me, where Father's Day is maybe a painful day today, Um, Maybe your father passed away. Maybe you didn't have a good relationship. Maybe you didn't have any relationship at all. I'm praying that you would sense God's deep comfort and encouragement this morning, that you would know that you have a heavenly father in heaven who loves you like crazy, and you've got spiritual fathers right here that love you as well. So we're in the midst of a series called Deep. Everybody say it with me. Deep. And so we've been dialoguing about how in the midst of an age of physical and social distancing do we go deep in the relationships that matter most, namely our relationship with God and others. And so last week, Pastor Mike, who's been like a, a spiritual father in my life, my mentor and pastor for almost the past two decades, he, fa- he preached a fantastic message on parenting and going deep with family. He sort of tossed out the challenge that, that we would use your words or our words to impress his words on their hearts, our children's hearts, and that God would command the blessing. If you missed it, Totally encourage you to check that out on our podcast or on our YouTube channel. This week is actually the last week of our deep series. Everybody say, oh, it's the final week. Um, But this week, I I really want to frame our time together this morning with a question. And here's the question. What does God want for Father's Day? Right? It's Father's Day. And so I want us thinking about as we're thinking about earthly dads, you know, what do they want and where are we going to go and where are we going to take them for, for breakfast or lunch? What does our heavenly father, our one heavenly father want for Father's Day? So why don't we do this? Why don't we stand together? It's just kind of what we're used to. Uh, get your circulation going there as we read and honor God's word. I'm going to read from John chapter four and then we'll have a bunch of different passages I'm going to dive into this morning. This is John chapter 4. By the way, sports are returning. Thank you, Jesus. And all the fathers said, amen. John chapter 4. If you hear amens, it's not angels. It's probably the production team. It might be angels, actually. Who knows? Um, John chapter 4 says this. Jesus is speaking here. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, everybody say true worshipers, True worshipers, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Join me as we pray. Jesus, speak to our hearts this morning. Heavenly Father, we welcome and invite you in. Would you comfort our hearts? Would you reveal to us our hearts? And would you show us your heart? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go ahead and take your seat wherever you're at, living room, kitchen, coffee table, dining room. Excited to have you joining us. Um, my, my son Liam is almost four years old now, which, which feels crazy, and, um, and he's at that stage where he wants to help dad with different things around the house. Um, now he's four, and so obviously we have to contextualize what he can actually be helpful with, but to be honest, as a dad, I just love the fact that he wants to help, and so... Um, just this, a few days ago, I think, he, was, he wanted to help me with something, and so I was doing a, a little fixer project, which to my level of skill basically means taking an old toy of Liam's and swapping out the batteries so that it will work again for Lucia. Don't judge me, okay? That's, that's my handiness level. And so Liam came, he's like, wow, Dad, you can fix that? I'm like, I can, son. I sure can. And so we were getting, you know, swapping out the batteries. I have the battery tester, you know, I'm doing it. And, um, and so I was like, all right, son, we got everything all swapped out. Go find me the little back for this toy, you know, so I could screw the back back on and we're good to go. And so he runs off all excited and, and he's gone for a long time. I'm like, son, come on. And he comes back and he brings me like a random dinosaur toy. He's like, look, dad, I found, I'm like, son, no, no, go get the back for the thing. And he goes back out and he's gone for a long time. He comes and brings me back something else. And he, he keeps going back and forth, bringing me random things. And finally I was like, son, bless your heart. And I sat him down. I looked at him in the eye. I, I said, son, if you want to help dad, you have to pay attention to what dad asks for. 
And I was really struck by this thought as it pertains to this morning, thinking about Father's Day, thinking about our Heavenly Father, because I think what I said to Liam in the natural significantly and deeply applies, especially in this moment, in the spiritual. If we want to love, to please, to cooperate and participate along with the heart of our Father God, we must pay attention to what Dad asks for. Which brings us to our message this morning. I've, I've sort of titled this message, One Father's Day. And it's sort of a multifaceted, layered play on words. And on one hand, I want us reminded as followers of Jesus that we are a part of a family. Every tribe, tongue, nation, and language under one heavenly father. Amen? But it has a deeper layer because th this morning, this message is actually a collaboration between 20 plus pastors, black and white, all across the state of Florida. We've come together, collaborated on a sermon. Actually, one of my brothers, one of my colleagues, an African-American pastor, actually started. He picked the text. He gave like a skeletal framework. We're preaching it together in solidarity as a symbol and a sign to the world that we are one as the people and the family of God. And so this morning, I want to talk about our one father, and I specifically want to tease out from the scriptures two key operative words that I think are crucial for us to get. I want to talk about our one father and what he has to say about worship and justice. Worship and justice. Now let me start us and, and kind of bring us back to the foundation, sort of a, a piece of commonality here as we approach the text. The foundational element for followers of Jesus is that it all begins with God. It all starts with God. Now, for those of us who follow Jesus, and by the way, if you don't, if you're sort of here because a friend invited you or you're investigating God, faith, and spirituality, thrilled that you're here with us, praying that you sense God's presence, you could just kind of listen in here and be like, oh, I've always kind of wondered what Christians think about things. But, but as followers of Jesus, our purpose is laid out in Scripture quite clearly. In fact, Paul says it very succinctly in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, to offer your lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He says, listen, here's the call. Your, your, your body, your lives are, are, are supposed to be living sacrifices. As followers of Jesus, we live to worship God with our words, with our lives, and with our actions. And it is important to note that God is the one who sets the definition of what pleasing worship is and what it looks like. Right, the, the, the terminology is essential here. We're not saying, oh, worship, well, it's kind of whatever you decide. Worship is what God says it is. Now, the same is true when it comes to our current moment in culture, thinking about things like justice and injustice. The, the same reality bears true, that as followers of Jesus, when it comes to justice and injustice, we do not start with culture, we start with God. We begin with the scriptures. We begin with the inventor and originator of justice himself, God, the righteous judge, the loving father. It all starts with God. Now, as a brief means of recap, we actually did a whole series in the month of February on justice. If you remember, it was called Jesus, Justice, and Diversity. If you missed it, man, listen to the whole thing. It was a four-week, five-week series. You could check it out on our podcast or our YouTube channel. Um, but we talked through that, and we basically formulated a short operative definition for the word justice biblically. We said that justice means to do, you remember this? To do what is right, what? In the eyes of the judge. Justice is to do what is right in the eyes of the judge. Here's the problem. If all we do is take justice according to the cultural narrative, we are trying to hit a moving target, which never happens. We need to go back to God's standard and God's word. This means that when we talk about worship or when we talk about justice, it doesn't start with earth. The conversation starts with heaven. We pray, we work, we live for what? Jesus told us on earth as it is in heaven heaven. It means that for followers of Jesus, this conversation does not start with news, and it does not start with media. It does not start with talking heads or political pundits. It doesn't start with left, and it doesn't start with right. As followers of Jesus, we start by looking up. So let's start, amen? Let's start by looking up together this morning. Amos chapter 5. 
Here's our core text we're going to camp in a little bit. This is God speaking through the prophet Amos. Say, get ready. Whew. God says, I hate. No, no, no. Actually, I despise. Just want to clarify. God says, I hate. No, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not even look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If you recognize those words, those were the same words that were preached and orated so eloquently by the late Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., Here's some backstory for Amos that's important for us to understand in grasping the text. God calls Amos, who was not a professional prophet or a professional minister. He was just an ordinary dude, follower of God. He was actually a shepherd and a fig tree farmer in Judah. Little historical context, the nation, the people of God, the nation of Israel had been split. There was a schism, you know, church splits ain't nothing new. And so down in the south, it was the southern kingdom of Judah, and up in the north, it was the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had grown prosperous. They had gained military conquests. They had grown complacent. They had spiritually turned their backs on God, and they had begun to engage in all sorts of evil and idolatry. Specifically, God calls Amos to go up from southern Judah to go to northern Israel to prophesy because specifically when the people of Israel had begun to engage in idolatry and sin, we know that specifically they were cheating, oppressing, and enslaving the poor. And God said this, no more. I'm done. Now there are two key operative words in this text that I need us being on the same page with biblically. Remember, we start with God. We start with heaven. One of these words is righteousness. Now, this word righteousness in the Hebrew is sadaka. Sadaka. You want to say that with me? Say sadaka. Sadaka. If you're not spitting, you're doing it wrong, all right? It's, what, what this word righteousness means in Hebrew it is, it is it is a standard of right and equitable relationships between people, no matter their social distances. Now, the second word is justice. This word justice in the Hebrew is mishpat. Say that one with me. Mishpat. Mishpat. Th this word mishpat, it refers to concrete actions that you can take to correct injustice and to create righteousness. Righteousness is what God desires. Justice is seeing that come to pass on earth as it is in heaven. Are you connecting the dots here? See, now what, what, what's interesting in this chapter, in Amos chapter 5, is that God calls his people through Amos to worship and repentance in a very peculiar way at first glance. Check this out. Amos chapter 5, verse 4, if you flip back a little bit, it says, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. He, he, he continues, he says, Seek God and live. Seek me, God says, and live. Seek the Lord and live. And then if you fast forward a few verses in verse 14, he says, Seek good and not evil that you may live. Now, it's a bit interesting because it's like, did, did God have a spelling error here? Is he like, oh, snap, I added an extra O. I meant that to say God, not good. My bad, you know, you guys understand. Seek God, then live. Seek God, then live. Seek good, then live. Did God have a cosmic spelling error? Did he miss his spell check in, in heaven's soft word? Or is, well, I don't know, dad jokes, all right, it's Father's Day. Or, or is he doing something intentional? Obviously, God's word is perfect. He's doing something on purpose. See, he says, seek God, then later seek good. Why? What's happening here? Because seeking God and seeking good are inextricably linked according to God. They're connected. If you remember, Jesus said this. He said, they asked him, teacher, rabbi, what's the greatest commandment in the Torah? What's the greatest commandment of the scriptures? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We talked about that last week. Pastor Mike did. He said, but the second commandment? Man, it's, it's tied right in. The second is just like it. The second is linked to it. What does he say? And love your neighbor as yourself. He, here's the point, and we see, it, we see it illustrated here in Amos, and we see it reiterated by Jesus. The point is that true worship of God, true worship, right? That's what he's looking for, true worshipers, spirit and in truth. True worship of God should always lead to justice, righteousness, and loving our neighbor. Why? 
because we all have one loving Heavenly Father. Let me give you an earth analogy. My, my wife and I have two children. Our daughter, Lucia, is almost one month old, one year old, I'm sorry, this month, which is crazy. I'm like, I feel like we're going to get out of quarantine, and she's going to be like walking around, speaking in full English sentences. How are you doing, Father? Would you like to go to the park with me today? I'm like, what? How, how, how long? How long, Lord? Look forward to seeing you guys in person soon, hopefully in our microchurches. Anyways, not the point. Lucia is about to turn one. Uh, imagine if Lucia is there and she's just cr- she's screaming, she's crying, she's just having this moment. And my son Liam comes up to me. He's like, "Hey, Dad, let's go play." And I look at Lucia having a meltdown there, and I look at my son and I'm like, "Well, half my kids are fine, so you know why not?" And I just go right. You would be like, "DCF, like what kind of dad are you? That's so negligent. That's so horrible. Why?" Because we would all acknowledge that if one of my kids is not okay, then none of my kids are okay because they're all my kids. See, at the end of the day, if we are endeavoring to fulfill the call, the biblical call for worship, it means that our lives and our songs and our actions need to line up to the definition that God creates. And what God seems to make abundantly clear in the book of Amos and all throughout the totality of scripture is that what he is looking for is not the sacrifices from lips or external actions of lip service. What he's looking at is the heart. My father was was one of my mentors and and one of my heroes, faith heroes, life heroes, and and he passed away unexpectedly of a stroke about a year ago. And and so my dad was just a, a loving man, a kind man, a humble man, a genuine man, and and he sort of had these like sayings. He would always say these, these certain sayings. And like a wise old rabbi sage, he would say these things. He would say, son, life is full of choices. Choose God and choose good. He would tell my brother and I always, be kind. He would, I would ask him, dad, you've been married almost 50, 50 years when, when he passed away. How in the world is this beautiful Jesus honoring marriage? I'm like, how in the world? He said, you know, son, I always prayed one prayer. Lord, change me. But his, his favorite saying, mom, you're already going to know which one this is. His favorite saying, I mean, over and over and over, he would say this thing is, son, with God, it's all about the heart. And church, if there's something that I want us to to get in our minds and ultimately endeavor to get in our hearts, it's that with God, he's not just looking at the external. See, man looks at the outward appearance, but God is after what? The heart. See, God wants our hearts. He wants my heart. He wants your heart. And as his children of our one heavenly father, we want his heart as well. I want you to listen to his heart here as revealed in scripture. It says this in Psalm 89. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation, or God, of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Isaiah 61, 8 says, for I, the Lord, love justice. Check this out. He doesn't say, you know, I, I prefer justice. You know what? If I, if I had a choice, justice or injustice, I'm like, ah, I'm thinking justice. He doesn't say, you know, I, I, I like the idea. He says, I, the Lord, what? Love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. Luke chapter 4, Jesus comes in, the image of the invisible God, the embodiment of the heart of God, and, and he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He stands up in the synagogue, and he intentionally reads this verse. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Church, I want us to press in to the heart of our Father. And in the midst of this moment, we've been having lots of very honest, raw, tear-jerking, heartbreaking conversations in our microchurches and, and amongst our staff. And so after the killing of Ahmaud Arbery and, and then it sort of barreled right into George Floyd a few weeks later, we came into staff prayer and, and I'd just been praying. I'm like, God, I, I don't even get it in my head. I, I, I haven't, I'm hearing some stories. I don't even have a schema in some ways, I feel like, for processing, but, but I'm seeing the hearts of my family, church family that I love. God, I want your heart. God, I want your perspective. And so I came into staff prayer. Be careful what you pray. I came into staff prayer. And we're just sitting there, and we normally read the Bible, and we talk through a fluency. And, and, and I end up laid out 
on the floor, ugly cry snotting, sitting there. I'm, I don't know when the last time the carpet was clean because it smelled horrible, but I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm bawling my eyes out. And we're, we're there, it's this holy moment and, and a bunch of the staff are there crying and we're processing and I'm finally like, God, what is this? And he says, John, this, son, this is my heart for all of my kids especially my kids and your brothers and sisters who are people of color right now. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm feeling the heart of God at church. I got to be honest with you. You watched me two weeks ago sit up there and try to articulate. and I'm just crying the whole time. I'm like, the, the heart of the father right now is breaking for his kids. I'm like, God, I want your heart. God, I want your heart. If Rabbi Neil were here preaching on Father's Day like he so often did for us here at Greenhouse South Florida, I can already guarantee you where he would go at some point in his message. He would be reminding us that with God, it's all about the heart. Church, I, I'm pleading with us. I'm, I'm, I'm longing for us to realize this scriptural truth when it comes to what we see in Amos, to realize this biblical reality that we see echoed all throughout the scriptures. I am praying that as followers of Jesus, we would learn to live this out with God. It's all about the heart. God, we want your heart. This season is gut-wrenching. This is easily the most challenging life season that most of us have ever experienced and maybe ever will. And in the midst of COVID isolation and economic uncertainty and the anxiety and panic that is vying for our soul's attention, church, where's your heart? Give God your heart. In the midst of racial tensions, where we're grappling with the, the gross evil realities of individual and structural racism and bias and prejudice. Church, where's your heart? Give God your heart. In the midst of this season, I mean, I've had lots of videos sent to me. I had COVID videos sent to me. I've had race videos sent to me. I've had all sorts of videos sent to me. And I have tried to watch every single one of them to the best of my human ability and have conversations. And I have to be honest, Greenhouse South Florida Church family, I have been so deeply encouraged to watch the way that our church family is grappling with everything right now in the world. Just so you know, we have not even close to a homogenous group. We got people from all different political spectrums. We got people from all dis different age demographics, cultural backgrounds, life experiences. And it's been a joy as your pastor to watch the way you have navigated through your political backgrounds and your political leanings and your life experiences and how you were raised. And yet to watch people who serve Jesus first. I'm telling you, it makes all the difference. One of the videos I was watching, this guy's, you know, talking through different things and wrestling through different things. And at some point, he's, he kind of stops and he's like, you know, I, I just got to say this. He said, okay, I'm Jewish. You know, I, I don't have like a, a, a religious bias in this one. He said, but, but I got to be honest with you. I don't know how we're going to figure this out. I have no idea what we're going to do with the racial divide. I don't really know what's going to happen in this country. He said, but I got to be honest, the only group I've ever seen get even close to doing this to some degree is born-again Christians. He said, now listen, it hasn't been perfect. So I hear this, I'm like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Like, I'm, I'm thinking about all the ways the church, the family of God has blown it when it comes to slavery and, and, and evil, wicked men who are spiritual leaders misappropriating the way of Jesus and Christianity to justify an evil practice of man-stealing that was explicitly condemned in Scripture. I'm thinking about church leaders. Uh, I, was thinking, I was reading something from Jack Hayford, and he was like, man, I look back at the civil rights. He's a white pastor, a prominent white minister. He said, I look back at the civil rights movement, and, and, I, and I just regret not stepping in to that space and realizing the movement of God that was happening in that moment. I mean, I, I'm thinking about all the way the, the church has blown it, and, and he's like, but I got to be honest, you know, they're not perfect, he said, but they're, it just seems like they've got something there that, that the rest of us don't have. And I was listening to this guy, I'm like, bingo, it's Jesus. It's one father where all of his kids come under one banner, every tribe, tongue, nation, and language, church. I, I, I have to let you know this is our moment. 
in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of the division, in the midst of every scheme of hell working to bring about stealing, killing, and destroying, Jesus is coming to bring life. And if we would press into his heart, church, I'm telling you, it's a sign and a wonder. I'm having conversations with people that wanted nothing to do with Jesus, and they're watching you guys imperfectly but genuinely step into this space and have honest conversations with love in your hearts because you're asking him for his heart. And they're like, okay, I, gotta, I might have to give Jesus a second look because there's something here. Church, I don't think there's ever been a more difficult time to endeavor to live out the John 17 prayer of Jesus that we would be one, and yet I don't think there's a more powerful, needed moment than right now. I mean, just think about it for a moment. Can you imagine what it would be like if we could unite in this climate, in this moment, as one for his worship and his justice you're like how how would we even do that action steps here's what i'm praying we would walk away with and do this morning number one i want us to listen i want us to listen and i want us to listen to god first I want us to listen to God and the truths of his word first. I want us to listen to his word. I want us to listen to his heart for all of his kids. I want us to listen to his call for worship and justice at his definition. I'll give you a challenge. I dare you to read Amos chapter 5, what I read this morning. I dare you to read Amos chapter 5 every single day this week and ask God for his heart and just see what he does. I want us to listen to God first, and then I want us to listen to his kids. I want us to listen to, to, to members of our church family, the stories of our brothers and sisters in the family of God, especially brothers and sisters who are people of color. I want us to listen and lean in with our hearts and ask God for his heart while we open our ears to be a vessel to be used by his spirit. Church, I'm praying that we would not be those people that just lean on media or social media voices that we do not know that, let's be honest, are probably getting paid, are definitely getting paid in their sort of niche that makes them rich. Listen, we, we, this is both on the left and the right. Let's be honest, church, Jesus followers, let's be smarter than that. And press in to the relationships with God and the people in our church family that we actually know. I don't know some talking head, and to be quite frank, I don't even trust him, but I trust Jesus, and I trust you. Let's lean into that. Unity, diversity, under our one Father. Number one, I want us to listen. Number two, I want us to ask. A-S-K, ask. Just in case you're wondering what I said. Psalm 139 says this. David is penning this. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive or, or wicked way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. I think this is an amazing prayer to pray in this moment right now. You're like, John, are you saying? Here's what I'm saying. You are a human being. And if there's anything as followers of Jesus, we should be experts at, we as Jesus followers should be professional repenters. Professional, like we should be so good at it, we should be pros. It should be easy. Why? Because it's the overwhelming call of Scripture. This is a fantastic moment to pray this very biblical prayer. Why? Because biases are human, and prejudices are human, and offenses are human, and bitterness is human, and selfishness and callousness is human. Church, let's be more than human. Let's be born again. Let's operate and press into the supernatural abilities given to us by our one heavenly father to live out the prayer of Jesus to be one. Church, as your pastor, as your brother, as your friend, listen to me. The world responds in such predictable ways at this point across party lines. Things are so, there goes my water bottle. Just like in person, I still knock it down. The world is so binary. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live different. The world returns hatred for hatred and bitterness for bitterness. 
And yet our Father is calling us higher. The world on both the left and the right will be looking to press the buttons to rally up the masses in what they think will be the predictable response. Church, don't fall for that foolishness. Don't fall for it. I need us to recognize something. As followers of Jesus, the reality is we don't serve a party. We serve a king. And his name is Jesus. And he's not wearing an elephant. And he's not wearing a donkey. He wears a crown. And every single one of us bow to him from every tribe, tongue, nature, and language. Church, we're different. We're a peculiar people. We're a holy nation called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you saying that? I'm saying that. That's what I'm saying. God, we want your heart. Lord, make us one. Jesus, help us to see with your eyes. And God, please, for your glory and our benefit, give us your heart. Microchurch leaders, Jesus followers, disciple makers, put your hand up in the air real quick. If you're in any one of those categories, let me see your hand. All right, I need some accountability here. You just raised your hand. Check out this verse. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, He says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. This season is gut-wrenching. And for probably all of us at this point, in one way or another, you feel like you're being poured out, like you're being spent, like you're like, God, I, I don't know what to do. And here's the heart of Paul, as, and let me speak it to us as followers of Jesus. I am praying that we would be sons and daughters of our one heavenly father who are very gladly spending and being spent for people's souls. Church, this is what we signed up for. I feel like I'm dying in this moment. It is the way of Jesus. And if we all die, we all live. Our lives for the gospel. It's the heart of the Father. And it's what God the Father ultimately did for us. Let me land it here. I came across a story, this had to be maybe a month or so ago, of of two young soldiers, and and it just stuck with me. And and this week, in in prayer and preparation, it kind of came back to my mind, and and basically, it was, it was two young soldiers. They were out in a very remote area on patrol, and, and one of them gets hit by sniper fire, middle of the night. He's laying there, bleeding out, laying there for dead, can't get to his radio. It's basically a, a bygone conclusion. This guy's life is over. And somehow, miraculously, this other young soldier hears a commotion. He goes to investigate, sees this guy lying on the floor, bleeding out, dying. He, he jumps in there, stays low, pulls him out, administers first aid, is able to preserve his life long enough to get him to a medical facility. They get him to a medical facility, save his life. The doctors are like, listen, this is a miracle. If this guy wouldn't have found him and did what he did in the exact moment that he did, there's no way this guy would be alive anymore and so the parents of the soldier whose life had been saved they start looking for this guy who saved his life they say where is he what happened and the doctor's like I don't know he went back to his post and and so they ask the military they're like who who was this we want to thank him they're like we're not really sure it's kind of a remote thing we didn't really track it and he never really said exactly what happened and it's a true story by the way and so the family goes home this 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 man's name is Yoav who survived him and they put a little story up in their in their small grocery store, this family-owned business. And they say, man, you know, hopefully someone will see it and, and we'll figure out something. A year goes by. A woman goes into the store. She sees the little write-up, and she remembers that her son had told a similar story to her about a year earlier. And so right there, she gets on her cell phone. She calls her son. She says, hey, listen, I see this thing. He remembers it exactly. He's like, oh, yeah, that was, that was me. That's what happened. I remember that. She says, you got to come down here. Fast forward, they end up getting the families together. I want to read this. It says, soon all the families gathered together for a joyful, tearful celebration. But one of the mothers knew there was an extra reason. Here come the tears, all right? <laughs> I told you. One of the mothers knew there was an extra reason to celebrate. Doran's mother, who was the one that saved the man's life, told Yoav's mother, there's a specific reason why I came to your store today. You don't remember me, but 20 years ago, I was standing in your store feeling lost and broken And you and your husband noticed how sad I looked. Asked me what was the matter. I explained that I was pregnant. I was overwhelmed. There were so many unbearable difficulties financially, socially, emotionally. I had decided that the only way out was to have an abortion. And you both stopped everything. And you calmly and lovingly sat with me. And you listened to me. And you offered me much encouragement and support. And because of you, 
everything began to look different. And I chose to keep my baby. I don't live around here any longer, but, but I happened to be passing through, and I figured it would just be nice to stop in and visit your store and to thank you all once again for what you did for me that day. She said, I need you to know the name of that precious baby was Doran. And my beloved son, Doran, who would not have been born if it was not for you, grew up to save your son's life. You're like, John, why are you crying? You don't even know these people. I'm not crying because of them. I'm crying because the story's about me. The moral of the story, church, is that I was that young man on the floor, bleeding out, no more hope in this world. Radio was unreachable. I had gone to the end of my rope, and I was done because of sin and rebellion. And Jesus came in, and he saved me. And if you're listening to this message right now, you might be getting a little teary-eyed too because he saved you as well. And what I need us to know, church, and what I need us to feel from the heart of our Father God is that ultimately our greatest joy and honor in this life is to partner with Jesus and his mission to bring healing to the broken like we were and hope to the hopeless, to uplift the downtrodden, to bring justice and liberty to the oppressed because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Church, at the end of the day, we spend ourselves for others because he gave his life for us. And so we respond and worship with our lives. Why don't you join me as we pray together? You can bow your heads and close your eyes if you want, just for a moment of, of quiet and privacy between you and God. If you're here this morning and, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Even now, Holy Spirit, would you begin your work on our hearts Father God, we invite you and in, begin to work. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. This season is exhausting. This season has been heartbreakingly difficult. If you're here this morning and you're at the end of your ropes, if you're here this morning and you're like, I don't know where else to turn. I'm not even a church person, but I need something. If you're here this morning, I've got great news for you. Hear the words of Jesus afresh. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, peace, right standing with God that's only available in Jesus. If you're here this morning, I need to let you know, if you've been searching your search is over. If you've been hoping, you have found the hope you've been looking for. If you've been waiting, you can wait no more. Jesus is the longing of your souls. Jesus is the answer to the cry of your heart. Jesus is the itch that you have not yet been able to scratch at the deepest soul level. And he loves you and he gave his life for you even before you cared anything about him. And he's calling you home. And if you want to respond this morning, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Wherever you're at, wherever you're joining, wherever you're watching, even if you're watching later on, I want you to say these words. Jesus, my heart is yours. Wherever you're at right now, you can begin to, to just pray a heartfelt prayer to God. Something along the lines of, Jesus, I'm listening. You've got my attention. Help me. Teach me. Forgive me. My heart is yours. I want to give one more opportunity. Maybe you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus. You've already begun this relationship with God. And yet during the course of this morning or the past few hours, days, weeks, months, maybe it's even been years, you sense God working, softening, doing something in your heart, tapping you on the shoulder. If you would like to return this morning to spirit and truth worship that our Father desires, if this morning you'd like to ask God to allow your heart to feel his heart for worship, justice, and mercy. Wherever you're at, I want you to say these words. Father, my heart is yours. Lord, you know every single person that's watching right now. You love them more than any other human being ever could. Would you move on our hearts? Would you teach us to follow you above every other voice? above every other individual, above every other leader, Jesus, you are the CEO, commander-in-chief of this church, and you are the leader and the king of our hearts. You can look up at me. You can open your eyes if you're still praying. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer with me, 
there is a high probability that God is doing something incredible in your heart right now. Here's what you do. You tell somebody. I mean, right, if a friend invited you, they texted you, and they reached out to you on social media, right now, hit them back. Say, listen, let's talk more about Jesus. He's doing something in my heart. Wherever you're at right now, maybe you're like, I just found you guys on a Google search. Reach out to us. If you're on the church online platform, raise your hand, request some prayer. We would love to connect with you, to help walk with you along this faith journey, to speak words of life and encouragement, to pray with you over any request, to walk you through your journey. We've got these online micro churches, which are communities to help support you in your journey. We got these summer deep dive classes. Dive in, jump in. We would love to come alongside you and walk with you in your journey under our one heavenly Father. Church, I pray God would bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious up to you, that God would lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, shalom, perfect peace in Jesus' name. God bless you, church, and we'll see you this week online.